You know, I've been watching tennis for almost 20 years, and I've seen a lot of things. This one, I have not seen. Fuego means fire, for uh, for your information. If you're not a Spanish speaker, take a listen. I know in the back, it's burning. I smelt it as well. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Fire, fuego, fuego. And now this thing is burning. Some flames coming out of the backboards, we're told. Jerry Armstrong's seen most things in this sport, hasn't he? I'm not sure he's seen the advertising boards got up in flames. Everything is burning now. Now, right now, they are looking around for the world's tiniest fire. Uh, apparently, it's pretty tough to find. I think, let, let's zoom in here. It looks like there might be, like, a slight burn mark on uh, whatever this advertising uh, digital signage is. It's like a, you know, it's like a, basically like a TV with advertisements on it that flash up. You're playing a, a slideshow of adverts rather than having a, a big billboard. Eventually, they decide to play on, but that was not the end of it. Oh, this is the best. Look at this. This is Dirty Dan giving Zverev a look saying, uh, I I'm not playing on if there's a fire behind me, mate. Sorry. Sorry. But they get back to playing, and then Sasha Zverev notices the digital signage that they have on the side of the umpire's chair is now flashing which is uh, pretty distracting. You can't play tennis when that's uh, in your peripheral vision, flashing like a strobe light. Take a look at how the umpire fixes this one. You hear that? You hear it. You don't see it. You hear him slam it. He hits it. You know, like, uh, I remember there's a James Bond movie called Goldeneye with Pierce Brosnan from uh, the late 90s. And uh, the, in Russia, they're like, the car's not, this guy's car's not working, so he breaks out like a sledgehammer and hits the engine, and then it works. That's basically uh, what they're doing in Madrid. A lot of interesting stuff happening in Madrid today. Kasparut boy! Kasparut boy! But probably nothing more interesting than Mr. Konish22. Take a look. Somehow, I've got Casper Rudboy for the title. His forehand should do well in these conditions. It sure did, as he took out fellow uh, co-prince of clay, Dominic Team. I guess you got to have some Roland Garros finals to really get that title. One of the uh, biggest names on clay for the last few years is out to one of the best performers on clay when you go to the smaller tournaments. Casper Rudboy. Listen to the song for a little in his honor. Good to also see Christian Green give uh, Danny Medvedev his wish. This was earlier in the tournament. Take a listen. I don't want to play here on this circuit. Well, pretty clear what he's thinking. Well, you don't have to play here any longer, Danny. Uh, Christian Green and Casper Ruud, if you've watched smaller ATP 250s for the last few years, uh, ATP 500s on clay, you know, some of the, not the big name clay tournaments, some of the South American swings, what I'm thinking of. Uh, these guys have been winning on clay all over the place and doing well, getting better and better. These are two of the best young players on the clay. And let's take a look at what we got. And also, Konish 22, good, good call on that. Uh, a couple more comments there before we move on, actually. Alejandro says, uh, thanks for the videos, man. More of this. Well, we're going to do our best here at Coffee Break Tennis. In fact, if you want to see more Coffee Break Tennis, go visit us at patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis. That is where you can join the team and help us keep going and growing. Help me keep uh, getting more and more shows up for all the big tournaments. Uh, another comment here is from Simon Sadiq. Matt, you didn't see the BMW Open. It was good. Oh, well, the finalists were a bit old. A bit older than what you like to see, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, but I did. I saw the BMW Open in München and Munich, and uh, I, I talked about it. But the main thing I was talking about is what happened to Sasha Zverev. It's not that old. Uh, I believe, who won it? Was it Basilashvili took out, um, oh, God, I can't think of his name, the big German, uh, Jan, Jan Lennart Struffy Struff, the Struffmeister. 
Uh, yeah, you know, th- those guys, uh, it's not that they're older, and they're not really that old, or they like mid-20s, both of them. I guess Bazalashvili maybe a little bit older. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm mainly here at Coffee Break Tennis. We're talking about the biggest tournaments. We're all about the majors and the Masters 1000s. We're uh, always looking at the players who, you know, can do big things. We know the guys who are already well-established, and some of these guys who are a little bit older and haven't done great things yet and don't seem to have, like, a lot of upside and a lot of potential, yeah, we don't talk about them quite as much here. I'm sorry about that, but we do. I mean, obviously, the guys get a, get a nickname. Talked about Basil Ashley plenty uh, recently when he played in Doha because he played Federer. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, in two months... Someone will be at number 14 and number 21. Rafa knows this is history coming. Yeah, uh, that's from Gisela, Gisela Lombardi. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is the big story right now. This is really what it's all about. Like, we're on clay. We're talking about Rafa. He's going for 21 majors. He's going for GOAT, basically. And we're going to look at players who maybe could beat Rafa at the French Open. Yeah, there's not many of them. But Basil Ashvili... Uh, Jan, Jan Leonard Strafstroof, they're not going to do it. Uh, Christian Green, Casper Ruud, I don't think they're going to beat Rafa at the French this year, but those are guys that uh, maybe could do it. Sitsipas, he could do it. Dominic Team, he could do it. Sasha Zverev, if he had a really special day, he could do it. And what do you know? Next matchup, let's take a look at the schedule for tomorrow because we've got some great stuff. Probably going to do a show tomorrow. Uh, same thing as I said last time. If we don't get a show out tomorrow, it'll come the very next day. Uh, we're going to be doing at least every other day during these uh, Masters 1000s on the clay. Also, when Federer plays in uh, Geneva, Switzerland on clay, also right before the French Open. As you know, during majors here at Coffee Break Tennis, especially thanks to the patron saints over at patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis, uh, we, we try to do daily during the majors here. Uh, depends on what's going on with my tennis teaching schedule. I do have to... Uh, I do have to earn some uh, money from that, too. But, yeah, we'll be every other day, at least during these uh, Masters is the goal right now, and try to go every day during Majors. So, like I said, we'll be back tomorrow. If not, though, we'll definitely come back the next day and hit these things every other day. Take a look at the schedule. It took too long explaining all of that. Here is a great schedule for tomorrow, which is why I'm saying there could be a show tomorrow because there's a couple guys here. That I would say, I, I talked about this a couple years ago when I saw a lot of young guys. We were also talking about Jauma, uh, Spanish Jerry Seinfeld, Jauma Munar. Back then, he was looking like an up-and-coming, promising player on clay. He's kind of hit a roadblock a little bit, but Christian Garin, Kaspar Rudboy, they're getting better and better. But then, one of the things I said back then was that, so for Rafa, you see young guys coming who are pretty good on clay and might... As Rafa gets older, right, Casper Ruud at his best probably doesn't beat Rafa at his very best. But as Rafa gets older, maybe there's opportunities for upsets with young talent like this as they get better and better and more confident. And then I said at the same time, you look at Federer and Wimbledon, none of the young guys really look great on Wimbledon. But there are some really live arms out there that are kind of in the style of Nick Kyrgios. And what do you know? They're doing well here, and those are guys that I think could do well on grass that maybe could beat someone like a Roger Federer or a Djokovic or especially a Nadal who's more vulnerable at Wimbledon. They could uh, have a great serving day and take you out. And they're all doing well here. Bublik, kind of curious like with his serve. And then another guy, Big Papa. I think I'm going to start calling him Big Papa. Obviously, he's out. He lost to Rafa Nadal. But um, Poprin, he's uh, he's got the same kind of deal, a little bit like, uh, like a Kyrgios kind of serve and can really light it up. Took out Yannick Sinner. Yannick Sinner was in control of that match in the first set, served for it. Yannick Sinner looking as angry as I've seen him on court pretty much. I'd say top three outbursts. And he didn't really do it. You know, he didn't break a racket or anything. Rafa today, same guy, Popperin. Rafa hit himself in the forehead. I wish I had the clip for you. I would show you, but... Rafa actually whacked himself in the forehead with his hand. That's how angry he was to hit himself with his hand, not with his racket, not like Yuzni. But uh, Popperin, he, he's the kind of player that can frustrate you. When Popperin came out today, if you look at, I think the score of the final was 6-3, 6-3 Rafa. But if you watch that match, it's pretty tight. And Popperin, uh, he won the first seven 
seven points to start the match. He holds it love, and then he goes up 40 love on the Rafa serve in the second game of the match. Rafa ends up holding serve. Rafa's able to uh, to rise to the occasion, as he does so frequently, and he wins the match. But Pop, you know, Rafa, I think when he whacked himself in the head in that first set about halfway in, I think it was because he knew how dangerous Popperin is, and I think Yannick Sinner looking very angry in his loss, probably mostly because he failed to serve it out in the first set, but also because he knew he let a very dangerous guy get back in it. So interesting to see, guy, better give a shout-out to Berrettini, too. Another guy who could do very well on grass, and they're doing well here. John Isner, another guy who's always dangerous on grass. They do well here because of uh, the altitude, because the ball flies so much. And it, it's, you know, big serve like that, like Popperin, like Berrettini has, like Bublik has, like Sasha Zverev, who's done very well here. Did you know this? Sasha Zverev has never lost in this tournament, Madrid, before the quarterfinals. And, of course, he won it. I think he beat... Dominic team in the final, I want to say, uh, a couple years ago. Uh, anyway, so let's look at this schedule. Pretty much talked about all these names here. But Dominic team coming back from injury, coming back from a self-described falling into a hole is what he said, how he described it. Coming back from uh, some mental issues, you know, just kind of growing wary with uh, life on the tour. Uh, coming to terms with, I want a U.S. Open, what next? You know, will I be able to do something like this again? Uh, you know, if you set a big goal and you, as uh, Dominic Team said, you you 100%, 120% just run after that goal with all of your effort. You ignore different aspects of your life because you're so focused on the tennis. And then you achieve it. It, it is kind of a weird place to be. Uh, you know, I've never won the U.S. Open, so I, I can't tell you exactly what, what he feels. But from the way he described it, it seems to make sense. If you're just so focused and uh, consumed by one goal which I, I guess I probably have some kind of example not coming to my head from my own life. I'm sure we all do. When you're so focused for years and years, and then even if you don't succeed it, if you just kind of change course, it can be a strange time. So Dominic team going through all these things, coming back, looking pretty good. A close match today against the Demon, Alex Demon. It feels like forever I watched so much tennis today. That was uh, one of the first ones I watched. Anyways, is he ready to beat John Isner, who was, who was awesome that is the first match up tomorrow. Then Rafa and Sasha Zverev. A little upset alert for Rafa. Sasha Zverev, I know, I thought he was going to lose to Nisha Corey because he looked so bad in Munich, but he looked great. He crushed Nisha Corey. He hit, I don't think he double faulted at all. I watched most of that match, didn't see any double faults. He probably did. He double faulted a lot against Dirty Dan Evans today with the fire and everything going on in that match. But, you know, Dirty Dan made Sasha look beatable to me, but there's a reason why Zverev, he's right up there with Dominic Team and Tsitsipas with wins over the big three. These are the only guys that have beat all the members of the big three. I, I believe Zverev's beat them all. Yeah, he's definitely beat them all. Uh, Zverev has beat Nadal the last two times they played, not on clay, of course, but their last two matches, Zverev's won, I think, both in straight sets. Obviously, Zverev uh, has been beaten Federer for a little while now. Zverev's beat Djokovic. Uh, Dominic Team, Tsitsipas, they've done it too. But my point with Zverev is he loses the guys he should beat a lot. That's when his worst stuff comes out. That's when the nerves are the worst. I think he plays really well against the big three. I think he frees up, doesn't feel the nerves nearly as much, doesn't think about his second serve as much. And that's when we see his best stuff. I mean, just think about what we've seen him do at the World Tour Finals. Uh, just, you know, the way he's kind of brutalized the big three there. He's, he's, I think he's beat all three members of the big three in straight sets at the World Tour Finals. Uh, anyways, after that, Bublik and Kasper Ruud. How good was Kasper Ruud? We're going to look at the stats over Sitsipas because it, it, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's a bad loss for Sitsipas, but Kasper Ruud, he, he basically Rafa'd him. He, you know, and he's associated with uh, the Rafa Nadal Tennis Academy in Mallorca and all, stuff like that. So it makes sense that Kasper Ruud is taking on a more Rafa Nadal type mindset out there. It looks really, really good. Uh, then we'll get Berrettini and Christian Garin. Tough one, but where we are, you got to like Berrettini. You got to like Sasha Zverev if he can play great, if he can play near his best and not throw in double faults at bad times. I give him a good shot because of the altitude. Let's take a look. Uh, first, let me just show you one thing. This is uh, Isner and Rublev first set. I wish I had the stats for the whole match to show you, but there were no breakpoint opportunities 
for John Isner. He never even had a chance to break Rublev, and yet Rublev lost. That is a really frustrating match for Rublev. Sitsipas, the same kind of deal today. Extremely close match, but uh, I, Zverev and Sitsipas, they have a little bit of mental weakness. You know, to me, Sitsipas really is ready to win majors, and he was my favorite of the up and coming talent for the last few years, and and I guess he still is. But now we've seen him very mentally vulnerable. Think about last year, the way he lost to Rublev in Hamburg. The way he lost at the U.S. Open to, God, I can't even remember. Who took him out at the U.S. Open? Was it Borna Chorich? Whatever it was, uh, Sitsipas, you know, blew match points or chances to serve out the match. And it was all mental. And we saw it today with Casper Ruud. Casper Ruud played great, but a lot of mental side from Sitsipas, I think. If you can keep it really close with Sitsipas, I think the big thing is what we heard from Sasha Zverev. Zverev's been working on his second serve, and we saw that. That's what he said after he beat Nishikori. So we didn't see any double faults. We saw some double faults with Dirty Dan, but you know Zverev was beating Dan Evans in every department except hustle. Dan Evans was really battling hard. It was a great match to watch, actually. I enjoyed it very much. Dan Evans uh, doing uh, some of the stuff we saw Federer doing to win on clay in 2019 at the when he had his run to the semifinals at Roland Garros. A lot of serve and volley from Dan Evans. A really entertaining match. But uh, Zverev was, you know, outdoing him in so much that the second serves and the double fault, it didn't matter as much. Gave Dan some chances to make that go three, but he wasn't able to do it. If Zverev worked on his second serve, Kasper Ruud has informed us that he's been working on his first serve. And I think that was a big part uh, of why he beat Sitsipas and there's a mental side to that. I'll talk about that in a second. I still have this Isner Rublev stats in front of me. I just want to show you how tough it is to deal with big servers in these altitude uh, tournaments. It, well, it's really just Madrid. In Madrid, when um when you play guys like this with a big serve and they are on, look at the uh, 14 aces. I think he had 36 aces for the total match. Uh, never had an opportunity to break Rublev, but it didn't matter. Rublev, 11 winners on five unforced errors here. Uh, less unforced errors than John Isner, but 10 less winners. That doesn't make a difference. And John was just so good in the tie breaks, both first and third sets. Rublev, another one where there's some mental there. He let anger get to him right before he got into that first set tie break we're looking at the stats from. And uh, I think he went. He gave up the mini break pretty early. Okay, let's look at uh, Kasper Rudboy's big win, big upset over Steph Sitsipas. Here are your total stats. Since he passed with 30 spectacular winners, 19 off the forehand. Looks like, uh, you know, Casper had 10 forehand, uh, forehand winners, right? So almost double from Sitsi Pass. Plus 10. You know, Casper is only plus five, 17 winners on 12 unforced errors, but it's all about timing and it's all about dealing with nerves. Casper Ruud did a great job doing what Rafa does best, you know, getting the fear of losing or the thoughts of winning out of the mind and just staying super focused from start to finish. And again, we're going to look, look at the total points won. Dead even. This Sitsipas match kind of reminds you of those Federer wins, or losses, excuse me, like uh, the one in Miami against Kokinakis in 2018 comes to mind right away. Uh, the one in, was it 2017 or was it 2018 in Dubai against Evgeny Donskoy, the Donskoy debacle where... Uh, Federer wins more points than the opponent, but loses the match. This is, I think this tennis is the only sport where this can happen. Uh, maybe golf. You could, <laughs> that doesn't really work that way, but big numbers are not good in golf. Um, so, Sitsipas, same, you know, he, he might as well have won more. At 13, at 14 this is one of the reasons why I love Sitsipas on clay everywhere. He, he's so good at net. Uh, it's just that he's so good at seeing when to go. You know, he doesn't have the greatest hands. I said Kyrgios has better hands than Sitsipas at the net. But Sitsipas, you know, he's good hands. Don't get me wrong. They're not bad or anything. But, you know, he's not John McEnroe up there with the hands, Sitsipas. But he sure is one of the best on tour now at knowing when to go. And you can see that from the number. He, he only picked one bad time to go to net. And Kasparud probably came up with a spectacular shot in that one point he didn't win. Uh Let's see, serve points won, I guess Sitsipas a slightly higher percentage. I mean, this match was extremely close. What it comes down to were moments in that tie break and towards the end of the second set, it just looked mental to me. Sitsipas 
didn't have the belief the way Casper Ruud did when things got tricky. Uh, take a look at this. He's out serving Casper Ruud in the speed department, but this is something a little different here. Casper Ruud been working on his first serve, 191. That's pretty close, right? That's closer to the Sitsipas serve speed on first serve average than it normally would be. And I think these conditions, right, they helped Sitsipas a couple years ago beat Rafa here. But this time around, I think the conditions actually hurt. The fast conditions, especially with Casper Ruud working on his first serve, uh, I think they kind of hurt Sitsipas because Casper Ruud was able to win on serve so easy. I think that's what what got Sitsipas mentally was to be, and, and look at this, like the points won by number of shots. They're dead even here. You know, they're tied at nine shots over nine rally uh, rallies over nine shots. They're tied at the five to nine shot rallies, or I mean, sorry, Sitsi Pass is ahead by three, behind by three, and the five and under the quick strike tennis. Uh, a lot more spin from Casper Rude, you know, that helps on the clay. And then here's the big number for me Casper Rude is winning 80% on first serve. Like I said, he rafa Sitsi Pass. What did he do? Sitsi Pass, an incredible 63%. If you're hitting 63% of your first serves in and you're winning 82% of the time, and then on your second serve, you're winning 65% of the time. You're playing great. Those are Roger Federer numbers right there. Sitsipas is thrilled with that. That's better. You know, like years that we see Federer win the Wimbledon, win majors, he's averaging 61% or a little bit above first serve in. He's winning over 80% on first. That's one of the keys for the Federer game when he's going to be doing well, winning and succeeding at the majors. And he's doing uh, slightly better than 60% or slightly under 60% on the second serve win percentage, right? Those are the targets for Roger. Where I think Sitsipas went down mentally, because they had, there was no breakpoint opportunities in this match. It's kind of like the Isner Rublev. There was just one for Rude, and he took it right away. He took his first chance in the end of the match. To go through that match and for Sitsipas mentally to think, Casper Rude is winning 80% on the first serve, right? Sitsipas should be way ahead in the win on first. And then, yeah, he's way ahead in the win on second, 65 to 53. But second serve didn't come into play very often in the Casper Ruud service game because he's getting 75. This is something Rafa does. Win a high percentage of first serve points and get a lot of first serves. And like I said, he rafa him. And when you're playing that well as Sitsipas, you know you're playing great on your serve. And then you just... It's Casper Ruud again. This is not a. This is not John Isner. You can't get into these games. You can't get one breakpoint opportunity in a freaking hour and a half of play. I think that war sits sits Pass down mentally. Think playing a John Isner, playing a guy where you don't get any chances to break, and you have to be so focused. And then in a tie break, things don't go your way. You get a little unlucky. Next thing you know, you have a breakpoint towards the end of uh, that second set. You're out of the tournament. So. Some would say this is a bad loss for Sitsipas. I think Sitsipas, just get over it because the conditions in the French Open will be even more favorable in Rome for Sitsipas. He'll have a little more time to use that big forehand, uh, to use that serve has been really good. When the court is helping your serve, sometimes it can hurt the better server because now Kasper Ruud, not as good of a serve, but these conditions... The, the altitude, the court, whatever. It's not the court, it's the altitude here, in this case in Madrid. It's helping you out. Now, all of a sudden, we have more parity, and maybe that can kind of psych out the guy who's used to having a big edge on his serve. All right, uh, let's move on. Really quick, thought this was interesting. It's always worth, uh, it's kind of goes back to that comment from earlier was, Matt, you don't want to talk about old players. I, I mean, I'm really interested in these guys right here, 24 and under, who are making moves. Uh, Bublik. Even though he says he hates tennis and only does it for the money, the guy's got a live arm. He's got a serve that, you know, he can beat anyone on the right day in the right conditions. And uh, he's a fun player to watch. I like watching Bublik. He could do things. He's 23 years old. Ugo and Burr, we've talked about him before. Very talented. Uh, not as many big results lately for him, but he's one to watch out for. Only 22 years old. As he gets better and better, he'll be good all over. Uh, he's all court player. Taylor Fritz. I've been down on Taylor Fritz, but very talented guy. Of course, Demon Hour, Casper We know all these guys. This is these Sitsi Pass is at the top here. He's 22 years old. Don't forget, Sitsi Pass is still very young. So I still expect to see this guy win multiple majors. But it is, you know, it could come sooner. We could see him take it away from Rafa, right? I was thinking Sitsi Pass could beat Rafa at the French this year. It's definitely, excuse me, it's definitely possible. 
But after you see one of these matches where he looks a little mentally fragile, you start thinking, ah, maybe it's maybe it's still too soon. He needs to put it all together. Think of a uh, young Roger Federer, similar to Sitsipas, so much different skill set. Need time to put it together. Rublev, some mental issues, extremely talented and doing very well. You know, he, he's right there. Shapovalov, the mental issues holding him back a little. Yannick Sinner, this guy's freaking 19. Look at him, how he's blazed up on this list, right? It, most of these guys we've heard of for the last like four years. We these guys have all been on the radar. Uh, Yannick Sinner, not so much, and he's already fourth place on this list. So yeah, I'm very interested in these young players. Speaking of young players, let's look at Carlos Alcaraz. This is the height of the ball, eleven and a half feet or three and a half meters. They measured it. I don't know if you saw the match. I don't have the clip for you. I'm sorry, but Rafa in the beginning of this match. It looked like, hey, we might have something here. It was exciting. And then Alcaraz, he like, he strained his abdominal, had to take a little medical timeout break, and then wasn't really close after that. He showed some moments, but looked almost bad out there. Weird situation, having everyone say, you're the next Nadal. Uh, There might never be another Nadal. Probably, I'm leaning towards, there will never be another Nadal. Maybe Casper Rude can do it. <laughs> he showed some potential today. But it's it's kind of it's hard on you if you're Alcaraz to go play this match in front of all these people in Madrid with so many people saying, the next Nadal versus Nadal. And I just wanted to see, if, if you remember this point, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you didn't watch the match, watch it. It's in the first few games. Great point. It's still early and exciting in the match. You think this could be real competitive. And uh, Rafa, I think he hits an overhead and... Alcaraz runs backwards, jumps into the air, hits the ball, doesn't hit it in, and that's when he strains his abdominal. Kind of a weird injury. Almost looked like it was from anxiety and excitement and nerves, you know. It It was a weird thing, and it all went downhill from there. But, hey, credit to the guy for jumping up into the air and hitting a ball. That's like 12 feet high. It's kind of cool, right? Uh, Here's one thing that was important to point out. Alcaraz crushed Manorino, but look at the difference. Your average rally ball for Alcaraz... Right in the sweet spot against Manorino. Against Nadal, pushing you back. Not a lot, but a little. A little higher. You know, it's not a lot higher, but it's it's enough. It's a different look. Uh, one of the challenges that Alcaraz had, I think the main thing was uh, being called the future Nadal. Okay, um, what else do we got here? I'm about to get out of here. I wanted to talk about, you know, look at this. One more thing. Yannick Sinner, man. Tough loss against Popperin. Popperin's good. And once Popperin realized he could get back into the first set, he started feeling like he could win it. He played great. Uh, played, brought some of that to Nadal. And we saw it in the first seven points he won in a row, you know. But this was a big one. I think uh, the weakness with center for sure is, you know, his serve can still get better. He hits a lot of great serves. But on the second serve here, Popperin's second serve was harder to attack. Sinner is back on top of that, and Popperin just kind of stood in and took it to Yannick Sinner, and Yannick Sinner felt a lot. He couldn't hold. I think Yannick Sinner only held serve one time in that second set, so it was it was a pretty ugly loss for Sinner. He'll want to, uh, at the same time, you got to say, it's his first time going to Madrid and playing in these conditions, so overall, it's pretty good result here just to get a win here on your first time ever going and not having to qualify like Popperin did. You know, usually this is a smaller draw. Usually got to qualify. So Sinner earned his way into this tournament at such a young age. Grabbed a win in a foreign place. It's not like anywhere else you play on tour, really. So credit there and uh, good on Popperin, who played outstanding. All right, last thing. Medvedev, he didn't win Miami, but that mustache and the little story about how he was filming a commercial for one of his sponsors or something like that, doing a photo shoot, and they professionally, you know, did makeup on him and shaved him clean. And when they were shaving him, you know, they shaved everything. I guess he had a beard at the time, a little goatee or something. They shaved everything except they left the mustache for a second and went to go clean the razor or something like that, walked away for a minute, you know, grab a grab a soda pop or something. I don't know. And Medvedev sat there in that chair and looked in the mirror and said, I kind of like how this mustache looks. And then he had the mustache in Miami. Of course, when he lost, he shaved it off, got rid of it. It wasn't a good look mustache. But to me, that stands out. It's one of the things I remember from Miami this year and will remember forever now. Also, BS Russian, you know, with uh, Tsitsipas in 2018. I think that one was. You know, we'll always remember this. Well, now, even though he didn't win Madrid, 
I'm always going to remember this. Medvedev told everyone that he loves McDonald's. And after he loses a tournament is usually when he gets the McDonald's. But here's the big key. Listen to what Medvedev says. This is very interesting to me. I know it's uh, not the most tennis-related thing, but bear with me here. This is good stuff. Many times when I lose a match or when I finish a tournament, I take McDonald's. I like McDonald's because it's really good in Russia. It's much less good in USA and Europe. I don't know for which reasons that is, so many times I regret taking it, but that's kind of child's dream. Many times if I lose match, like when you are down, I don't know, you take ice cream, I take McDonald's. Okay, so I had to investigate, you know me, what exactly do they have at uh, McDonald's in Russia? So I found this article from travel, thetravel.com, 10 awesome Russian McDonald's foods that you can't get here in the states let's count these babies down we're not going to do all 10 we're just going to do the ones that i noticed hit the music because we're getting out of here uh number one this is the one that caught my eye the most the grill gourmet burger take a look at that thing that is not your standard burger what is in there you can tell from the word gourmet it isn't going to be your standard simple patty this exclusive to Russia comes with minced beef and pork patty between two slices of mature cheese, sweet pepper, and grilled fresh salad on a soft potato bun. Serve with garlic, lemon sauce, and herbs that give it a unique upscale flavor for a most eloquent McDonald's burger. You'll spend about 278 Andre Rublevs on just the burger alone. In a medium combo, well, that will run you about 329 Andre Rublevs. Belgian chocolate mousse. Not your standard McDonald's dessert, but they have it in Russia. Um, panini Tuscany. Looks good. Looks a little bit like a hero to me. Uh, there's a little about Russia that will remind you of Italy, but there must be a desire to eat Italian food because this item made Russia's McDonald's menu. For only 188 rublevs, the Panini Tuscany comes with loaded with not one, but two juicy grilled beef steaks, slices of tomato, and listen to this creamy Emmental cheese. That is definitely not at McDonald's in the States. Arugula and raw onions. Yeah, they don't serve raw onions uh, too often. Actually, you know what? McDonald's might have raw onions here. I don't know. Shrimp roll. A lot of people like this, some kind of wrap with the shrimp. That one caught my eyes. All right, like I said, we'll either be back tomorrow or the very next day. If Sasha Zverev takes out Rafa Nadal, and believe me, it's on the cards. There's always going to be a chance. It's up to Sasha from here on out. But he's got the skills. He's got the conditions. He could do it. Uh, if that happens, we'll probably have to come and do an emergency show tomorrow. See ya!